Welcome to episode 118 of Broad Street Hustle, back from the happiest place on earth, uh, Disneyland, Florida. So I flew in today just to be back on the show to host uh, episode 118 of Broad Street Hustle. I'm your host, Tommy Nanny. I got Jason Sayetta with me. Hey, Tom. What's up? Jason. Jimmy the Chalk. See, the answer to that was Saratoga, not Disney World. Happiest place, well, place on earth. Yeah, they say happiest place on earth, and you just see a bunch of parents walking around with not smiling and kids crying. But although my kids were pretty good, I must say. Um, and we have last place finisher of the Broad Street Hustle trivia, Christopher Michael Meeker. The most expensive place on earth is what it is. That's why parents are walking around so unhappy. You're seeing all their dollars coming out of their pocket every day. You just have to have the right connections, and uh, maybe maybe your dreams could come true. Can I, um, can, right, I let's... can I can I interrupt and say happy birthday to Meeker, uh, belated birthday. Um, happy birthday. And, and you Meeker, cannot interrupt. We're gonna, we're gonna cut that out. You're gonna cut that out. Well, I'd like Meeker to uh, let the crowd know uh, how old he is now. Meeker. That would be as old as you, even though you beat me to it. So that would be the big five two. I don't have this. I'm trying to think of a sports guy that wears 52, but no, no one comes to Jesse mind. Like, yeah, maybe, uh, it has to be a linebacker. Maybe it was what was Jesse Cox, Small. the linebacker? Not 51, right? Was Jesse Small 52 or is he 58? I forget. Brian, Brian Cox. Brian Cox was 51, I think. Yeah. 51. 51. Brian Cox was, yeah. Rokon Smith, one of those guys, I think. One or a relief pit or a relief pitcher. You might you might get a fifty two on a relief. Yeah, I'm sure there's like some sort of relief pitcher out there who wears fifty two. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good well let's wish. let's jump into it. I'm gonna do a lot of hosting on the show as I did not happen to see a single Phillies game since last oh, good for you. Last Friday, <laughs> but based on text and Twitter and 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 alike, I didn't miss much. Um, and we're actually going to start with the trade deadline. So I just saw the headlines. I didn't really di dive into them. So I'll let you guys take it away. Um, Jason, you want to kick us off with the, the trade deadline? We'll, we'll start with the Phillies. We'll, everybody will get their take with the Phillies and then maybe uh, a little sprinkle, a little MLB in. But, um, you know, good, bad, man. What, what do you grade them? What did they miss out on? What did they improve on? Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so they made four trades. Um I like the trades he made. I don't think he made enough trades. I think there's two moves that he's short on. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll start with Austin Hayes for Dominguez and, and Pache. Uh, you know, Phillies, I've, we've all said, I've said, you know, whatever you want to say for weeks now that they needed a right-handed hitting left fielder. They got one. Um, he's, he's a very good outfielder. He's great versus left-handers, mediocre versus right-handers, but, you know, he's good enough to be a starter, and I think he's he's going to play, you know, 85 90% of the games for the Phillies there. So um, you gave up, you know, you hardly gave up much at all for me. I mean, you gave up Dominguez, who way too erratic. You want to give, give his name, Jason? Give. The guy they got. I didn't say Hayes. I'm sorry, Austin Hayes. I thought. Oh, I don't think. It. I don't think so. I may, maybe you did. Yes. I might have missed it. Yeah. Um, so they gave up uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez, way too erratic, you know, and then Pache, who you know, dime a dozen player. So uh, All, already already DFA'd. <laughs> he already got sent down. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a very good trade. Uh, I really like that trade. Um, the second trade, I think, was just as good. I mean, you got Carlos Estevez uh, for Klassen and Aldegari. Estevez has been unhittable for the last two months. Um, coming into this, I think he had retired 58, 53 of 58 batters, and I think he retired all six that he's faced so far for the Phillies. So, uh, and that's since May 1st. I think he's only given up one run. Legitimate closer. He doesn't nibble. He goes right after guys. He throws strikes. Um, you know, he gave up two promising arms, but you gotta you gotta give something to get something. And you know, I I, I like that trade. Um, and then he turned around yesterday and he traded for Tanner Banks, or two days ago, uh, whenever the deadline was. Who was a, a he's a lefty. He's very good against lefties. He's a guy that could give you multiple innings. Um, and then last second, he got rid of Gregory Soto. So, 
you know, Mitch Williams, 30 years later, whatever you want to call him, just guy who was wild. He didn't throw strikes. He didn't do what they thought he was going to do when they traded for him, you know, last year. So good riddance to him. And I'll just tell you right now, uh, I, I wanted them to get a number three starter. I do not trust Ranger Suarez as a number three starter. I do not trust Christopher Sanchez as a number three starter in the playoffs. I think you are going to have trouble when you're going into game three of a series, using those guys as starters. And then especially in a game seven, I don't want either of those guys starting. So I think he dropped the ball, not bringing in a, a number three starter. And I think he dropped the ball, not bringing in another right-handed reliever. You cannot have this Ruiz character coming into, in, into close games like he did yesterday and, you know, give up runs. So, uh, all in all, I'll give him a B plus for the deadline. Okay. Uh, Maker, what do you think? No, I agree. I agree with most of uh, the assessment that Jason has, uh, you know, talked about here. Um, I was, you know, I guess I was a little bit more hopeful, you know, that they could get a center fielder with a bigger bat than an Austin Hayes, who is kind of like the mirror image, of the, you know, right-handed version of Brandon Marsh. Uh, but, you know, I'll take it because, you know, you're not mortgaging the future with the with the uh, prospects that they gave up um, big on Estevez. I think that's a great move. I think he steps in as the closer. If he doesn't do that right now, and eventually he'll be the full-time closer in the team, which we all said we needed um, the other small moves that they made, you know, for the left-handed reliever and getting rid of a left-handed reliever. So Soto and just replacing him with a left-handed specialist, I guess I'm okay with that because I couldn't stomach watching Gregory Soto continue to pitch in high leverage situations any longer. And I have a problem even dealing with that with Alvarado these days. So they definitely needed another left-handed uh, reliever. And uh, the other trade is escaping me. What was the other one? Sorry. Um, you, you, that's the four. You know. That's basically it, right? You know, cause, but just getting rid of Soto was a separate trade. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, I think they've improved the team. I mean, I, I had wrote down my winners and losers for the trade deadline, and the Phillies are on my list of winners. I think they made some good moves, maybe not the big splash that uh, you wanted to make, but what team did make a big splash in this trade deadline? No one really did. Uh, no one in the National League did for sure. Um, so although they're in this swoon that they're in, um, I think that they'll be, you know, in better shape moving forward because uh, they addressed a lot of needs. So, yeah, I agree. B plus is a good grade. I go with that. Yeah, we we alluded to it in the past. I mean, the third wild card just changes the dynamic of the trade deadline a lot because so many teams are just relevant still. Um, you know, it's hard to make deal like justify your fan base for trading away a big player and you're, you're one game, two games out of a, a third wild card spot, which is surprising for whatever reason. We just we always trade with the Orioles who are, you know, who are sitting on top or second place of their division. Chalky, what did you think? Well, I mean, you know, uh, for those uh, for the thousands that listened to last week's show, you know that I was uh, advocating hard to go after some of the bigger names and just put a stranglehold on the uh, on the postseason. Um, Miller did end up on the DL uh, as we were recording, and then uh, A's didn't move Rooker. So, I mean, you know, those guys didn't go anywhere else, so I'm not going to blame Dombrowski for not going after that. Now, I, I haven't seen the full story, so I've only seen the headlines, but it looks like they were poking around on Crochet. I don't know how close that was or wasn't, but so there was interest in maybe bringing in another starter. Um Suarez going to the IL, you know, Mika mentioned that he he just had looked tired at times. So I'm wondering if there's really a back issue or if this is like, look, let's give him two weeks off, freshen up a little bit and, and just rest or if there's a legit physical issue there or not. Um, and uh, we talked about so many different closers and Estevez wasn't one of them, but he's having a, a great year so far. And Hayes, you know, he was an all-star last year, and I don't think anybody thought he was on the trade block because you usually, you know, two two championship contending teams trading pieces that were, you know, legit. I mean, Dominguez is up and down, but I honestly didn't think him or Soto was going. Certainly we would have rather seen, you know, Ortiz and, and one of the other guys, but 
apparently Soto's agent reached out to the Phillies and said, hey, if you have a chance to move him, he's open to it. So when a player does that, I mean, do you really want to keep him around? Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, yeah, I mean, again, no big splashes for the Phillies, which, you know, we probably did expect. I think they made they made good moves, um, but it's going to come down to the guys that they already have in the lineup, which we'll get to. But uh, just real quick, does anybody remember the last time a Carlos Estevez pitched in the playoffs? This Carlos Estevez? A, a Carlos Estevez. <laughs> was it Charlie? Was I, it Major I League? I know that there was another. Was it uh, Charlie? 1989, was it Charlie? 1989 Cleveland Indians closer was Ricky Wild Thing Vaughn. Of course, that was Major League. Charlie Sheen, real name, Carlos <laughs> Estevez. Uh, good one. Uh, yeah. Lucky. I, well, I got it, though. I said it. Um yeah, do you think do you think Dombrowski was like hamstrung a little bit from from Middleton? You know, not more not trading away the the, the Millers and and you know painters etc. Or do you think that was Dombrowski on his own? Anybody? I I don't. I, I think Middleton. I think Middleton wants to win just as much as any owner who's ever you know owned the team in Philadelphia. Um, I I don't. I think. Uh, you know, and knowing Dombrowski, I think he would have given up. I don't know if he would have given up Miller or um, Painter, but I think he would have given up Crawford or you know uh, Kaba or um, Abel. Abel. Uh, I think those guys would have would have gone. Um, I don't know why he didn't get Jack Flaherty. Uh, it seemed like he was out there, and you know, I know the Dodgers gave up you know a few prospects for him, but I wanted him. I wanted a number three starter. I, I, you know, I really wish, I think the right-handed reliever, I think they think Spencer Turnbull will be back for the playoffs. And if he is, then that's fine. I guess you got to live with Ruiz or Marte for the time being now, but you need seven relievers in the playoffs. And right now your seventh reliever, if Turnbull doesn't come back is Ruiz. Not good enough. So we'll see. Yeah, all right. Well, Mika, you you said you know you, you had some winners and losers of the trade deadline in general, and you said the Phillies were a winner. Who uh, what what else was on your list? What winner or loser around the league? Yeah, I mean, I think the Yankees getting Jazz Chisholm, as we saw this past series, was big for them. They needed that bat that they were sorely missing, and he made a big difference, you know, in their lineup at least for the first couple games here. So I think the Yankees were a winner there. Um, I think Cleveland also was a winner uh, in the trade that at the trade deadline, and I think the Padres, if you count the Arias trade earlier this year, I know it's not a deadline deal, but I think them uh, adding Arias and adding Tanner Scott was big for them, and I think they're a team I'm really a little bit worried about. Although me and Jason did talk about that the other day, he doesn't seem to agree, but. Uh, I think they're a team poised to make a move in the National League. And I'm also going to look at this in a different way, and I'm going to say the Marlins were a big winner in the trade deadline. Um, they Look, they just completely gutted their team, got rid of some contracts. They know they're not going to be winning anytime soon. Um, and they may be, you know, they're going to be down for a while for sure, you know, two or three years. But some of these con- uh, some of these guys they got in these deals end up being what they think they can. You know, they're going to be a team that might be, uh, you know, uh, in two or three years might be uh, the team you're talking about. So we'll see. Um, the losers, I thought the Diamondbacks were a loser because they really didn't do much. You know, most of these losers are just teams that they're, didn't do well, anything. They're a loser because they traded for your fantasy first baseman who's not going to play losers. now. So they're a loser. That's not the reason. I just think they're losers because they didn't really do anything to help themselves in areas that they needed to help themselves. I think the other way I look at the losers are teams that stood pat or didn't make trades when I think they should have, and that's Toronto, Colorado, and the Rangers. And the Rangers are a little bit of an interesting story because obviously they're the defending champ, and they're only three and a half, four games back of of the uh, AL West. But do they really think that they're going to contend for a World Series this year? They had some higher-priced guys on their team that they could have gotten rid of um, that may not matter, you know, because they're either going to be gone after this year is over or they're making tons of money and they could have put them on the block and they didn't do that. So they decided to stay pat, which I know defending championship teams tend to do, 
but I think they could have made some moves to help their future, uh, and they didn't. You know, so those are my winners and losers in the trade deadline. Yeah, Jason, anything quickly around the league is uh, the for trade deadline? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the Dodgers did well. Like I said, they got Flaherty. They they brought in some some depth bats in Edmund and Rosario. Kiermaier, I've always liked as a defensive center fielder. And then they added to their bullpen with Kopech. Um, they did a nice job, actually. And then I don't know what the hell the Orioles did, right? You know, Eflin's a good pitcher. That's fine. He's a good starter. We all like him. Um, you know, uh, but do they think they fixed their bullpen, adding Dominguez and Soto? No. They're a loser, too, yeah. That's, I mean, you know, and Eloy Jimenez, I mean, that guy is just in the in the toilet now. So I guess I, I did miss that they added Rodgers for the Marlins, too, but you know, I, I don't I don't think that they improved the way that they needed to improve and that the way they could have improved with the, the talent they have in their in their, you know, minor league system. And they should have went for it and they didn't. Um and I thought the Mariners did well. You know, they added some bats. They clearly needed bats. They added a Rosarena and they added Justin Turner. They added a decent bullpen piece in Garcia. So uh those are my thoughts there. And Chalky. Wrap this up. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll echo the Baltimore as a disappointment um, it, or as a loser. I mean, they really, you know, again, we like Eflin, but they needed a more top of the line guy. So, yeah. you know, if you go Eflin, go get Flaherty, too. Or or I said Scoob last week, I, unless Detroit was just dead set against moving him. They have the system and new owner and they're probably not going to be tight on the purse strings like they were before. So, you know, spend a little money and Scoobles a guy you could have had for a long time. He's got a couple years still, but, um, and they did, you know, they were expected to be in the mix with the Phillies and those other teams for a, a stud closer. And they, they didn't get that, you know, they just, they did not. So that surprised me. They're a good enough team to probably be able to win it, but they, they didn't do anything to really make their position better. Um, and uh, I'll also uh, include the losers is, is the White Sox. Um, they could have done more of what the Marlins were doing, and they did not move either their two big pieces. Um, so now another year will toll on those contracts. They'll get a year older. Maybe there'll be a better deal in the offseason, but you could have gotten, hopefully, you know, for them, decent returns on those two guys. They stayed pat in last place. Um, and just one other credit I'll, I'll give to Dombrowski. Um which makes him a winner of sorts is when you look at cost of acquisition, I mean, they got Estevez for less than some of these other guys got went, you know, were traded for. So, and he's as good, you know, as anybody else that, that got moved, you know, Miller didn't get moved. So for getting him cheaper than like, you know, cost of acquisition on Tanner Scott, for instance, you know, that's a win. And that's another plus in the Phillies column coming out of the trade deadline. Do you think that they'll sign him? I, I'm, I think they will. I think they'll consider it. Sure. I mean, otherwise you're looking for, unless you are confident that, you know, one of these other younger players is going to make that step next year. I think you, yeah. Why not try and get him for two years? Yeah. Yeah. I think that the whole thing with the crochet is, you know, his agent came out and said that in order for him to pitch in October, October, he was going to need a contract extension. And that just spooked everybody. And I think that's the one piece that the White Sox had aside from Robert that they could have made trades with, but Either the Robert situation, they just were asking for too much, and the Crochet's agent coming out and saying what he said, teams just weren't into it, you know? Yeah. All right, and we got about 15 minutes left before we move on to Saratoga Pick 5. Um, before we move to what's going on with the Phillies, let's remember our sponsor, Giovanina's Pizza. If you tried the rest, now try the best. Second location is now open down the shore. Get your slice before the summer ends. All right, Jason, um, you know, as somebody who hasn't watched the Phillies game since Friday, since I was on a away and didn't have access to the Phillies, what the hell is going on? Um, I just, every day I look and they, they lose their pitch, their starters are, are struggling, their bullpen struggling. I mean, Harper's the, the, they're running them out of town when I look on Twitter. Uh, you know, what is going on? So we got 15 minutes to talk about, uh, talk about this. So go yeah, ahead. I'll be quick. So they've, they've lost their last five series. They're four and 11. You know, you could point right to Harper and Turner for me. I mean, they're both in vicious slumps. 
And the thing that pisses me off the most about these guys is they try to pull everything. Now, when you're going good, that's fine, right? But when you're not, you know, when you're getting a pitch that's outside, you need to shorten your swing and go with the pitch and hit it the other way. These guys roll over on everything, everything. Harper's rolling over to the second baseman. Turner's rolling over to the shortstop. That's just what they do. Boom, the other night, the Tuesday night game, which they should have won, and he tried to be a hero instead of moving Harper over from second base. Another guy rolls over on the pitch because he's trying to pull it instead of going the other way with it. You know, I was irate at him on Tuesday night. Um, the starting pitching slipping a little bit, right? I mean, Wheeler was god-awful. Uh, on Monday night, uh, you know, Noel was okay. Um, Sanchez, you know, he didn't, he was getting, they were hitting rockets off of him yesterday. Um, and then the bullpen slipping a little bit like Strom has been, Strom has not been good in his last couple outings. So yeah, that, that was leaded into the all-star game as well. He started to slip prior to slipping. the all-star I don't know. Game. If, I don't know if they're using him too much. I, I don't know. So, um, I think this road trip came in a good time, you know, get away from all this and get away from WIP with their idiocy and whatever they're saying, you know, and just go out there. And uh, I think they have 10 games, you know, you got to win, you got to win six of them. Yeah. Yeah. Chalky, what's going on with the Phillies? That's a little bit of everything. And I mean, it's, you look at the Yankees series, it's the first time they got swept all year. So I guess that's something that the first time they got swept. But um, the, you know, the top three of the lineup were just abysmal in the Yankees series. And that certainly killed them in, in the second and third games. Um, Jason touched on Harper and Turner. Turner had a, 10 home runs in a month, which was, oh, that's a great month. But they all came in like the first week of the of the month because you know, both him and Harper, they've dropped 25 points each on their batting average throughout the course of the month. Uh, now, Schwarber played well in the uh, Cleveland series, so he hasn't been slumping quite as much. But, you know, those top three, um, those top three were killing. I mean, and then when you talk about the pitching and I mean, Topper said it all the other night, uh, you know, they're you can give up a home run here and a home run there if they're solo shots, but they're walking guys, they're getting singles and then the big home run is coming. So. Cleveland was losing three, nothing, boom, three run home run. All of a sudden it's tied. Uh, you know, yesterday, two outs, grand slam. Uh, Chisholm hit the three run home run to put the Yankees ahead before the Phillies tied it up. And then the Phillies, you know, how many chances did they have in extra innings or the ninth thing to win that game? They get the bases loaded and, you know, they were lucky to stay alive because Turner legged out an infield hit and then Harper hits it off the first baseman's glove. You know, uh, they're leaving the bases loaded, whereas the Yankees were hitting home runs. And I mean, that makes the difference uh, in the series. Now, Stott's starting to hit a little better. So maybe there's a little bit of optimism there. And Castellanos has, you know, had a decent series against the Yankees. So look, the top three have to get right. There's plenty of time to do that before the playoffs. But you have a very, you have a tough month. I think 22 of the 26 or seven games are against teams above 500 that are in the playoffs or on the verge of it. Um, you have a you have games against Florida and Washington. Those are the only below 500 teams this month. So it's not easy competition, but you, you're going to have to beat these kind of teams to make it uh, to the world series. So they're going to have to find a way to get out of it. Yeah. Meeker, what's your thoughts there? Well, I mean, in this swoon that we're talking about, I mean, I went through before the podcast, all the, games in the last five series. And I can honestly say that they could have won at least four or five of the games that they lost in these in these last five series. And reasons why they lost are all over the place from the bullpen blowing up, blowing saves, you know, not coming the, the bomb situation with not moving the runner on in extra innings against the Yankees, the Marsh drop against Minnesota. We can go on and on. So I look at the swoon and I say, okay, if those things happened and bounced the other way, I mean, would we even be talking about it? We say, okay, you know, we didn't have a great end of July, but it wasn't terrible. Um, so in a way, I'm going to positively spin this on something that Jimmy D said in the last podcast was that 
maybe it's good for them that this happened. You know, maybe it's good for them to realize that, you know, they're not just going to coast through this year and be the number one seed in the playoffs and have a little adversity, get a little, you know, a couple guys in slumps right now. And then, you know, in the top of the lineup slumps, that's when they struggle. When, when both Turner and Harper are not hitting, that's, that's bad news for the Phillies, you know, but you know, every one of these, every team, I guess, that wins the World Series does go through this. It happens at a good time. We're in July. It's not happening in September, you know, where you go into the playoffs on a bad note. So we got to get their, get their stuff together. You know, but I look at some of these losses and I say some of these pitching decisions that Topper has made, some of the fundamentals that they're not doing right um, is really the reason some bad defensive plays in the field, you know, that have caused them to – not get out of innings when they should be out of innings. And I can go on and on about all these different things, but I'll ask you guys, I mean, is it a good thing? Is it a good thing that they're going through this now where they can take, you know, and they've made some moves too, you know, cause it was at the trade deadline. So they've addressed some situations too, that we've all talked about where problems, is it a good thing that goes through some adversity in a season where you thought you were just going to coast through win 105 games, you know, uh, and uh, and go into the playoffs without really having these types of battles, being battle-tested. What do you think? I mean, um, it's it's relative to if they get out of it and start winning. I mean, it's a good thing yeah. if, yeah, they find their stride again. But if they don't find their stride again, then, then no. I mean, I think it's one of those things where the ends, you're going to know by the way the season ends more so than, like, you know, I, I mean, this core of players have gone through it. It's not like they needed to get battle tested. Yeah. This is the same team for the last two years that did this same exact thing just in the beginning of the season and then found their stride midway point. We just happened to jump out to like a historic start. And now they're doing the same thing that they've done the last two years. And and there was times when they were winning that they did their 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 batters went in the slumps. I remember there was a there was a series I forget who they played. They scored 10, 11, 14, 13 runs like a and I remember thinking, well, these Phillies, whenever they score runs like that, the next game you better believe they ain't hit. And they didn't hit. They scored one run, but they won 1-0 where Sanchez threw a threw a shutout. And their pitching bowed their hitters out. And they did that a lot during the se- during the first half of the season. And they're obviously they're they're both going bad now. So I think it all just comes back to if they're pitching, if they can find their pitching again. Because I think your your hitting's gonna they're not going to be consistent. They're always going to have these these lulls. So um, it's just whether you believe in the staff and the and the relievers. Yeah. I, well, I think the, let me just for one second, just re, not to rebut what you're saying, Tom. But you know the whole Suarez situation. You know, obviously what was he 10 and one at one point in time during the, for the first 11 starts or 12 starts, he was something like that. Him, if he is not right, if he is tired, if he's got arm issues, if he's got back issues, whatever's going on with him, then I would agree with you, Jason, is that they really needed to make a move for the starter. Because as you just said, Tommy, you know, their starters have been bailing them out for most of the season. Their starters are going deep. If you lose that guy, Now you're depending on that particular start to score five or six runs, you know, which you didn't have to do for the first 90, 100 games of the season. That's my biggest concern going into these last two months is how is he going to look going into September? Because I think it's huge. See, for me, like I, this is reminding me too much of the Arizona playoff series last year of the Astros world series, you know, I, I don't like these guys, and I'm going to I'm gonna point to Turner because he's starting to concern me. I don't want a guy who's going to hit 500 for a month and then hit 100 for a month. Like, I don't want that. That I don't want. I want a guy that's going to be more consistent. Like, he is totally in the toilet right now, Turner. He looks yeah, the like problem is you have a team of that. Your whole team is that way. For the I agree. Part. Even, that's even like a JT. JT does that, too. I mean, he's, he's in the toilet, a, too, right now. Like, yeah, he's I mean, they all, they all, they all go don't go with the pitch when it's pitched outside. They all try to pull it, and they roll over. Real Muto's another one that rolls over on everything. 
Like I know right before right before I I left and start tar, I I seen Turner hit at least five balls dribblers to the pit like a dribbler to the pitcher because yeah. he he I mean that's he did exactly what Jason's saying and that was leading into the last week and it sounds like he's been doing that, that happens thing when you week. roll when you try to pull a pitch that's on the outside part of the plate you're going to roll over on it you got to go with it you got to shorten your swing and you got to go with it so all right keep in mind guys let's we're we're gonna move to Saratoga soon, but a uh, couple more minutes before if of thoughts. Yeah, and, and that's what up. concerns me the most is they're too streaky. Yeah, Meeker, any last thoughts before uh, we wrap this segment up? No, no, no. I mean, I think that we covered it. I don't know if Chalky has anything to talk about with what we said. Do you think that this adversity um, is a good thing? Do you think that they, they needed this to wake up a little? I mean, I mean, who's the last team that just rolled through the whole season without getting challenged at some point to win the World Series? You know, I don't know. So, look, they still have the most wins in baseball right now with everything we just talked about. So they set a pretty good clip. Um, Turner streakiness, obviously, he struggled for till through what, like August last year. So uh, he's had extended, you know, bad stretches. Harper. He's he's been consistent by the end of the year, pretty much every year. So he is in that slump now. I have faith that he'll be out of it, you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, he's just not the player that has half year slumps um, throughout his career. So yeah, um, I'd rather them uh, get it now. Um, I mean, you mentioned getting in September. That's what happened in 2011, and they never quite got it turned around in that short series against the Cardinals, and and they got knocked out in the first round. So. Um, get through it now, and then, you know, they can hopefully be ready to go come October. All right. And I think that'll wrap up uh, first half here of Broad Street Hustle. Let's move on. On to Saratoga. Thoroughbred racehorses have been running here. Pick five that ends with the Whitney, the headliner of Saturday's saratoga race course races um let's jump right into it we'll start with race seven which does kick off the pick five it's a mile three sixteenths on the turf the saratoga derby it is a grade one um jason i'll kick it off to you are we doing uh we doing our top pick or are we giving all our picks how to how you kick it off and I, we'll follow suit yeah i was just going to go through and give all the auto horses like that i'm going to use basically all right, go for it. yeah so um, I'm going to spread here uh, since, you know, I'm giving away my thoughts later, but I'm going to be pretty thin in a couple races later. So I'll, I'll spread here. Um, and I think there seems to be decent speed in this race. Um, I'm going to use the two Euros, the four Diego Velazquez or whatever that name is. I, I can't read my writing, but Diego, whatever, uh, for Moore and O'Brien. And then the three Legend of Time for Buick and Appleby. Um, I'm also going to use uh, Pratt and I read, um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get by this race. I, I thought this race was a little, little tough. So um, the, that would be the eight Palomino with Pratt and Brown. And then the two Cugino with I read and Shug. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm spreading a little bit to get through this race just because I, I have solid opinion, more solid opinions on later races. So uh, four, three, two, eight in the order of the horses I like here. Okay, chalky thoughts here. Yeah, I'm I'm three four eight here. Um, I'll I'll make the eight my top pick. Um, came in second by head in its last two races, but those were um only his third and fourth races of his career. So he's still young. He's still got a lot of room to improve. Um, and if you watch that last race, he actually the the horse that won, who also won the American. A uh, turf at Churchill is a good horse, Tricari. Uh, Tricari got him by about half a length in the stretch, and the eight fought back and lost on a bob. If it would have been, you know, half a jump earlier or later, he would have won that race. So uh, at eight to one, I'll, I'll put White Palomino on top. But like Jason, I have the two Euros, three and four uh, involved as well. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to give much opinion here. I had three, four, eight as well. Um, I, I think you're dreaming if you get eight to one on the eight there. I, I mean, if anything, I think the eight's going to be shorter odds than the I red horse on the two. Um, I mean, the only thing with the eight is they walked on those paces 
mean, that was a really, really slow race, uh, slow pace going a mile and three sixteenth at, at, you know, at Aqueduct. So, um, I'm only threw him in because uh, you know Pratt Pratt did go to the brown horse. It is it is speed. Jason alluded to there is some speed, but as we know, sometimes the speed doesn't always materialize, and this is the horse that's going to benefit the most. My top pick is the three, um, the Appleby horse. If you if you watch that replay that last race, he just had nowhere to go in the in the on the rail. The other two horses got first jump on him, and he was just not going to make up ground on on a slow pace like that. Um, so if more, if Buick's able to get them in a better spot this time around, if there is a little pace to run into, I do think the three is going to blow by them this time. And then the four Diego Velasquez, I mean, his two left-handed races were good. So I, I can't imagine he's not going to run a good race. You know, it's hard to say with these Euros. I, I don't know if you guys got any, listen to any other shows that maybe alluded to the horse, but on paper, he, I mean, it looks like he's probably going to be the favorite. So I was three, four, eight as well. Um, he's just I think out of three. three. Three grade one, uh, grade yeah. one races and stuff. So I mean, I do you know. think the three four gets you through this race, but I I did throw the eight in as well because it's Brown, it's Pratt. I mean, and the speed does scare me. The speed always scares me in these turf races, especially yep. these marathon turf races. So, um, all right, let's move on. This is uh, the test. The test stakes a grade one for the Phillies seven furlongs. This looks to be a chalky race. Um, chalky. We'll kick it off to you. Do you see it uh, that way? Uh, we're going to be different here. I have a single, but it's the two denim and pearls for Cox and Irad, not uh, not Brown and Pratt. Um, look, I mean, obviously, uh, cutting back ways and means on, on the, the Wilson shoot ran a huge, huge race, huge number last time out. Um, but if denim and pearls runs back to that Belmont, she's right there with anybody else in this race. Eight bells did not go her way, did not break. As close to the lead as she normally had, got jostled around and was really just out of it um, by the time they got to the stretch. Um, but, I, I mean, kind of like Jason alluded, there might be some chalk here picks later on. So I'm going to go against the chalk here, uh, and I'm going to single the two, Denim and Pearls. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Yeah, I'm singling as well, but, of course, it's not Denim and Pearls. It's uh, Ways and Means. Um, you know, you say if Denim and Pearls runs back to that race, but where did that race come from? I mean, just look at buyer numbers. It's like not even close to that 96, the, the Beaumont. Um, so I think that's more of an outlier than the races, the other races. So even if she go, goes back to her norm, I think she's mid, mid 80s and ways and means cutting back just, I mean, blows that away, in my opinion. Um, where I have her buyers. I mean, she, you know, she was. It ran a 90 to start a race, dropped down to an 83, but obviously the trip was horrendous. Back up to a 90, throw out the Kentucky Oaks, where she actually ran well. Uh, cut back to a one turn. Um, yeah, that was the Wilson shoot mile at uh, Saratoga, where she just exploded. And I think she, I think she's sitting on another one. Um, and I think Pratt uh, handles her well. As you can see, he's two for three and three for three for the board. Jason? Yeah, this is my lock of the day, weekend, whatever you want to say. Uh, four ways and means. Uh, horse loves Saratoga. I think the horse loves one turn. Well, this is a one turn horse. Brown apparently loves this horse. Um, I, I think. I mean, I, I think she gallops in this race. Um, this is my single. Uh, if anyone else wins, I am not going to win. I mean, we can all agree seven to five probably is a gift, right? There's no chance. There's zero chance. I don't understand why she was. Her odds weren't lower, but no. Um, no chance. That all. all right. Well, let's let's keep it moving here. Move to uh, the uh, lure, which is a restricted race for horses that have not won a graded stakes in 2024. It's a mile and a 16th. So these are the type of horses. This, these are the types of races where you know, you either look at horses coming out of grade one, graded races who just missed, maybe beaten just by better horses, um, and now drop it into company where they haven't won a graded, or you look for horses off the layoff who is a graded horse, and that's where that's where I landed here. Um, so this is a single for me on some tickets. Now you'll hear when I give out a pick five. I do have a couple pick fives, but uh, the nine more than looks, which is Sherry DeVoe and Irad, um, which Irad will be very prevalent in many of my picks. Um, is the same coming off a layoff. The horse is, is a one-turn 
horse or a one mile horse, I should say, um, you know, does, does you just look at, uh, you know, first, second, first, first, third, first, and then obviously in the Breeders' Cup miles didn't disgrace uh, running six, you know, kind of split in the field there. Uh, coming off the layoff, if she's if she, he's ready, I think uh, everybody's running for second. Now, I did on another ticket throw in uh, quickly. I'll go through it. Irish Aces, who ran a nice prep at Saratoga as the favorite, but cut into a mile. Big Everest, who gets brave on the lead. And again, these speed horses, Rosario is great with uh, turf horses on the lead. So if this horse does get a lead, if it's semi-easy, I could see the horse getting pretty brave. And then um, I threw in Smoke and Tea, who always uh, seems to run good races when you're not expecting it. Um, Johnny V handles the horse pretty well, so uh, I threw it in. But I am uh, leaning more towards the nine as a single, Jason. Yeah, I'm going to go three deep here. Um, I am going to take – so, I mean, if, if listen, if the nine more than looks for DeVoe and I read is ready to win off of the, the layoff, I mean, he's by far the horse to beat here. Um, however, he is a closer. I do like speed at, at, at Saratoga. Um, so I am going to make the five big Everest, uh, for Clement and Rosario, my top pick. Um, he's got speed. He's won it at Saratoga. Um, obviously I'm using the nine, uh, more than looks, uh, if he wins, uh, it just means he's ready to win. And, um, you know, he's just better than these horses. I don't like his post. Um, he, you know, he is post nine uh, on inner turf, which is not a good post. But again, he just might be so much better than these horses. It might not matter. Um, I'm also going to use the one Kubrick uh, for Brown and the Tory. Um, he's running, he's been running with, you know, against better horses than these horses. Um, hasn't run that well. He did, did win a grade three. So, uh, or a group three. Um, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to go three deep five, nine, one. All right. Chalky. Yeah. The nine, the nine would be a strong a for me here. Um, I'll give a caveman later and it, so it won't be a stone cold single. I, I only have one other horse. I would you know, mess around as a C play. Maybe. Um, I actually have the two forever. Super Castellano and Trombetta um, should be amongst the pace, you know, uh, factors in this race, but, uh, and this is actually first time stepping up into graded stakes this year, but has won a couple lesser stakes and some restricted state races. So taking qualifies cause it hasn't won anything on the graded level like these horses here. So taking a little bit of step up, but, um, I'll take a little bit of a shot at that. So nine with a little two. Okay. Well, let's move, keep it moving on here. Um, we got the race 10, five and a half, the Troy. It's a grade two. Um, this looks to be another possibly chalky race. Uh, we'll see how Jason thinks. Uh, take it away. Yeah, I mean, this six Cog- Cogburn, how could you play against this horse? I mean, he loves the spa. He's by far the fastest horse. Most likely the only way he's losing this race is if he doesn't get it out of the gate. Um, I am going to take a small shot with a second horse in this race, and that's the one Mystic Magic. I've been using this horse in the last couple of races that we've um, handicapped on this podcast. Yeah, Jay, Jay, let me what, let me just ask, why why did the horse lose the last two races? Like, um, what, I, th- I think it's, uh, some of it was trip. Um, you know, uh, he didn't really have a great trip uh, in, in them, and uh, – you know, I, I think that hindered him a little bit. Um, I still think Buick may may be the best jockey in the world, so I trust him. Um, you know, uh, I I think the horse is talented. Uh, again, I just think I mean, it's hard in these five and a half races, especially at the spa, to come from the clouds and win these races. It just it is it just so is. tough. It definitely you is. You know, in a five and a half sprint, especially yeah. when you have talent at speed up front no know. doubt no doubt and you know if you ask me i think cogburn wins this race 90 percent of the time and i'm just going to say i'm going to take a shot small shot the mischief magic you know if he wins it probably blows up the ticket so i'm going to take a small shot using six over one um six with one in my multis and that's it all right chalky 
Yeah, it's Cogburn and move on for me here. I mean, you know, we watched him set a track record at this distance at, at, a couple months ago at Saratoga. He set very fast fractions and just kept running. Um, and, you know, and it's funny when we were when we were up there for the Belmont, uh, you know, we're talking to some folks up there and the comment was made that, you know, everybody knows how great Buick is, but that if he's not in a grade one, he doesn't always give you a grade one type ride. Now, this is a grade two, so it's still very prestigious, but um, take that for what it's worth. I just think if Cogburn's on his game, it's he's going to be coming from the back. You need not only a perfect trip, you need to be closer. I think it's too much, although the one is certainly a good horse. So single Cogburn, go to the next. Yeah, I'm sitting on Cogburn here as well. I, I, you know, to Jason's point, the only way this horse loses is if he doesn't get out of the gate. Although he's one on off the lead as well, so I don't know if even not getting out perfect, he he loses. But certainly, if he gets out, it's over. Um, you know, and that for me, that's not really an angle I like to go against is hoping a horse doesn't get out because if that's the point, if that's the thing, I don't know who's gonna win. You know, if, if Cogburn doesn't win, I honestly could say that anybody could win the race at that point. So it's either you got to go crazy deep and not use Cogburn or just single and move on. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm choosing to just single and move on. You know, maybe if it's like a jockey who's kind of a clown show, but it's I rad, you know, you're not there's really no no negatives with this horse. Um, and I rad isn't a jock. I mean, he gets out of the gate better than anybody. I rad. He just doesn't always go to the lead. So I, I don't see him having a problem getting out of the gate. And then once he gets on the lead, I, I just think it's over. So I'm um, Cogburn all the way. Move on to the Whitney. Um, all right, let's let's do that. And uh, Chalky, you're up in, in line to start us for the, the showcase of, of Saratoga Saturday. Mile and eighth, grade one Whitney for older horses. Um, you know, always um, some people – some people love this race more, you know, the most at Saratoga. And if we had Jimmy D on, I'm sure he would give us some stories about past Whitney's and past winners. Um, and this race actually came up pretty salty. I mean, the names maybe aren't as big as, you know, like X Derby horses, etc. cetera. But um, it's a tough field. It's a very tough field. Chalky, where'd you land? Yeah, it's certainly along with the Alabama Travers, one of the most prestigious races and one of the biggest weekends there. Um and you got a full, you got 12 horses. So that's always great to see in an older grade one. And, you know, back in the day, you used to, you would see three year olds run in the Whitney and then come back in the Travers, uh, like, uh, easy goer did. Uh, but we don't see that anymore. Anyway. Um, look, if you think national treasure is the same horse that won last time at Saratoga, he might be a stone cold single. He's got four consecutive negative numbers on the sheets. He's won at Saratoga, the mile and the eighth is going to be fine for him. He's beaten these horses this year at a mile and an eighth in the, uh, the Pacific or uh, excuse me, the Pegasus, uh, invitational. Um, he's not going to be a stone cold single for me. If you're going to go ABC, he's a, he's a, he's a big a, um, I'm going to throw the 10 in on a couple tickets. His, his form is hit or miss, but He's had uh, a couple races that if National Treasure is just not at his best, he could be uh, competitive there. And there's a couple horses here you could say that about. First mission, certainly. Um, but I'm looking for something a little bit longer than that if I'm going to play against National Treasure. So I'll use Skippy Long stocking lightly, um, but it's going to be mostly National Treasure. All right. Yeah, for me, I was actually six deep in this race. Now, I did have a, I did have a top pick um but i was six deep um including national church but my top pick was actually the seven croupy which is i rat again which i mentioned he's prevalent i mean this race is loaded with speed um and there's a couple horses that like they gotta go to the lead to win i mean i don't see them not going to lead to win um there's uh, who was it when i was looking earlier uh was it the I forget now, but uh, maybe, oh, maybe it was the, well, Arthur's Ride, the not, the eight wants to go to the lead. Obviously, National Trevor's going to get, Treasure's going to go to the lead. Il Miracolo has some speed. First Mission has speed. Uh, Warrior Johnny has had speed in the past. So I, I think it's going to be a, a contested pace. So I was looking for a horse off the lead. And I read, you know, nursing along a, a horse that's going to come from, from way back, has won twice at Saratoga. Um, one at the 
distance, I believe. Yep, three times, one even longer. So I don't know. I just think it's a horse that's in in form right now, improving. Pletcher may have finally had this horse peak at the right time. You know, I know he was a, a horse that he gave a shot uh, as a maiden in graded races as a three-year-old. So he's always th- thought well of this horse and maybe finally got figured him out. Um, so Kruppi is my top pick seven, but like I said, I am six deep. So I also had, and if I go through my list, I had National Treasure, of course, because, you know, my ticket is pretty thin otherwise, so I'm not going to not include National Treasure. Uh, I, I had First Mission as well, more more as defensive. Like maybe there is speed and First Mission sits right off the speed and gets first crack and Kruppi just, you know, has too much to do late. So First Mission, Kruppi, as I said, um uh, Pletcher's other horse, Bright Future, who's run some big numbers, and he's going to be coming from uh, mid-pack as well. And he's, uh, what, wow, three for three with Castellano, so that, that's that's nice to see. And uh, the nine, the 10, Skippy Longstocking, as, as Chalky said, for the same reasons. And, you know, Arthur's ride, you just can't ignore speed after putting that number. Now, I do think the track was playing inside there for him and um, speed. But who knows? I mean, we've seen it many times. Maybe National Treasure wants to sit off and they let the, t- the 11 go. I don't think so. But like I said, with the ticket that I constructed, I'm, I'm going to play a little defense uh, in the Whitney as I do think it's a wide open race. Jason? Yeah, I'm going to go four deep here. Um, I'm going to spread. So I am using speed horses. I'm using a horse that's close to the pace and I'm using one closer bomb. Um, I don't. I don't know if you could call National Treasure my top pick. Uh, Tepidly, maybe, but I don't even know that. I mean, I'm I'm pretty much even along along the boards of who I like in this race. So, but he's definitely one of them. Um, he just might be the best horse, you know. As Chalky mentioned, like he's running negatives on Thoroughgraph, you know, consistently now. Um, he also might be the fastest horse. Um, so you have to you you can't ignore him. You have to use him. I'm also using the 11, though, Arthur's Ride. Um, he ran a huge race last day out at, at Saratoga. Um, if he gets to the lead and for whatever reason, you know, one of the horses doesn't, uh, you know, National Treasure or one of the other horses, he, he just might keep going. Um, he, he's an improving horse, so definitely using the 11. Um, his only bad race was in slop, too. So, you know, again, I, I like him. Um, I, you have to use the nine, I think, too. Bright future. Uh, he ran two huge races at the spa. Um, I like horses who like Saratoga on dirt and turf, so definitely use. And then my last pick is a bomb. He's a closer. I don't know if he'll be a bomb, but at fifteen to one, he's a bomb. He's proven to love the spa. He's paired zeros down on thoroughgraph, so he might be ready to to, to make a jump up, and uh, he may improve. And that's the seven croupy, you know, Tommy's horse. Um, I don't think you could. I don't think you could not use that horse. Uh, he really only be- ran a bad race in the, in the last handful. Um, was in Dubai. Um, very consistent, like Tommy said. Pletcher likes him, obviously. So I am definitely using him. So um, one three nine or let three eleven nine seven in no particular order, but I'm using all four of those in my multis. Okay. All right. Let's give out some tickets here and I'll kick it off and we'll just go around. So I, like I alluded to, I got three tickets So try to stay with me here. I'll, I'll do my best to say a number in it with a name. So the first race I was uh three, four, eight. That was the two euros and the, and the Brown horse on the outside. Second race, uh, I was single to the four ways of mean. Uh, this is the ticket where I, I use four horses in the, uh, turf in the lure where I was four, five, eight, nine. I was single to Cogwear in the six, and I actually single Kruppi the seven on this ticket. For 50 cents, that's six bucks. Um, then I'll go to my second ticket, which is three, four, eight, uh, single to Ways of Mean, single to the nine more than looks, single to the six, single to the seven for a dollar, that's three bucks. Uh, so that's a little bit of a press ticket to Kruppi. And then here's the uh, sort of just the caveman style, if you want to call it that. Three, four, eight again. Single to the four, single to the nine, single to the six, and then I'll finish the Whitney with three, five, seven, nine, ten, eleven for fifty cents. That's twelve bucks. Three tickets. That's a total of twenty-one dollars. Jason, I'm going to give one ticket. It'll be fifty cent. Fifty cents. Pick five. Uh, it's going to cost forty-eight dollars. Uh, race seven. I'm going to use the two, the three, the four, and the eight. 
Race eight, single, uh, four ways and means, no one else. Uh, race nine, one, five, and nine. Race 10, one and six. And then race 11, three, seven, nine, 11. And again, for 50 cents, that is $48. All right. And Chalky, finish it off. So caveman style, uh, race seven, have three, four, eight. Uh, race eight, have the two. Race nine, the two, nine. Race 10, the six. And with the Whitney, three, 10 for a dollar. That is a $12 ticket. And you okay. can press the nine and the three and a larger ticket if you feel ambitious. You'll make a lot of money doing that. Or you could just send it my way and I'll make a lot of money booking it. Um, uh, sorry, I've, I've been out. Um, all right. Well, that is that concludes Saratoga Saturday. Pick five and then with the Whitney. Uh, hopefully we, we gave out some winners. We gave out some winning tickets. Uh, looks like there's a way we can... No, we can't all win because Jockey did have the two in, uh, as a single, which we didn't. me and Jason didn't have. Uh, but I would assume one of us is going to win with the Ways of Mean or that horse. So hopefully we gave out some winners. Episode 118, Broad Street Hustle. Have a great night.